we got our APRS tracker. Requesting communication, sir. Let the meat stack. Snyder, KD2 VGT. Uh, Dave is, is from uh, Seton Hall Prep. He is the uh, a science teacher, you know, at the school, and he's also the director of educational technology. Uh, Dave is, is working with his kids on, I think, a project that I think you'll find really interesting tonight in terms of looking at uh, ham radio as a STEM project. Um, he's recently licensed as an amateur, so go easy on him tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and obviously, we'll, 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 any technical questions we can hopefully answer because we're all flarkers, right? And thanks to Carl, okay, you know, for sort of being our, our, our backup there as well, too, in terms of APRS. Uh, Dave's recently licensed in, in December of 2020, and I think you're going to find out that he brings a unique experience of a combination of pure science, teaching skills, project management, and amateur radio. Okay, so I think uh, really brings, I think, a great experience in terms of uh, the, you know, his students at Seton Hall Prep. Uh, and obviously, we've got a, we've got well, at least one of his students on board here tonight. So, Patrick, quick wave to everybody. So, and there he is. So, and obviously, uh, he'll be part of the presentation as well tonight too. So, without further ado, let me turn the program over uh, to Dave. Sure. Well, uh, again, thank you for having me. You know, this sort of evolved a little bit over time, and uh, it, it's special to be in front of all of you. This was this project was so important to our, my students that I had to rush and cram and study to get my technician's license. Thank God I passed or else I'd have to face my own students <laughs> as soon as Christmas <laughs> break was over. The, uh, and that enabled us to do this really enjoyable, rewarding project. I've been teaching now for, this is my 26th year. This, uh, this was the, probably the coolest and most rewarding experience I've ever had. And the main reason was really because this project was owned by the students. And I'm a, I started as a teacher, as a pretty traditional teacher. I tried to make science enjoyable and exciting and fun and uh, rewarding and really special because my experience with science when I was young wasn't very special. So I wanted to make it very special for them, but I thought I was very traditional in how I taught, mainly me lecturing, you know, question and answer, kind of like the, how a lot of us probably grew up. And when we created this STEM class at Seton Hall Prep, we decided that even if I didn't have technical expertise in an area, that wasn't going to stop our students from really embracing, I, you could say, maybe the spirit of Thomas Edison or, or whatever you want to say in terms of, you know, f right, fail, first attempt in learning. We have these students in this class who are really hard workers and who really have this passion to learn. And we decided that instead of it being a lecture course, that it was going to be all hands-on and it was going to be project-based. Once a year, we decide to do one project as a class. And my father, who was not, who was not a teacher, my dad was in the, the business world for 55 years. Uh, he and I were speaking several years ago about creating a high school project that follows a business model about. So we had, you know, Patrick's here. Patrick's going to speak in a minute. We have project managers. We have tech coordinators, logistic coordinators. Um, we even had guys doing marketing for this project to kind of hype people up a little bit. So the joy of this project was actually that it wasn't mine. Right? The joy of this project, I just got the chills, I kid you not. Right? The joy of this project was that the students owned this, and I think and hope that they were probably as excited as I was, 
but man, it was just like, a, you know, almost like a coach watching players, you know, win a state or even national championship. And you know that you were there and moderating a little bit, but really who got it done? The team did, right? And that's why these guys were referred to as a team. So I don't want to say they became celebrities in our school, but <laughs> pretty close, pretty close. So what I'd like to do before I get involved in some of the details of what we did, I actually want to mention Patrick because I tell everybody in our school that this was a, a, a student pride project, right? That they own this. So Patrick, could you offer these... Uh, people, uh, I don't want to say gentlemen, because I don't know if there's any women in the crowd, but could you offer them a little bit of your perspective of, of this project? Uh, yes. So my job for the project, I was one of the project managers, which means that I was having to coordinate between the teams and the people and make sure that everything came together as well as possible. And for some of the cases, that was like making sure that the instructions for us for when we launched the moon were perfect, or when we had the right day, or if our tools were working as well as they were. And that was a unique experience because I was, I knew nothing about Hammer Radio before this and learning about all of this and learning how to make sure that everyone's working together as a team was very important. And I really liked that. And us all coming together and the day of Mr. Snyder didn't even need to advise us that much, maybe just one or two pointers here and there, but it was us all together working as a unit and getting this job done. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. That well said, well said. And maybe if you can hang for a few, if anybody has any questions for you in particular, and then you can go and, you know, relax on your Friday night. But um, Patrick brought up something really interesting is that these guys were so owned this project that there were moments where I didn't go in that maintenance bay where they were launching it, where they were putting, doing everything. Cause I just wanted them to realize that I trusted them, but I wanted them to realize that no matter what happened and Patrick, right, we talked about this a million times that whatever happened on this particular launch, whether it was good or bad fell on them. Right? So if it was horrendous, well, uh, it was going to be on them. If it was awesome, it was also going to be their moment uh, to shine. Um, so I was the only one who had the license. Um, and to be honest with you, my level of knowledge of, of ham radio is right now in its infancy. But before we go any further, and there's a couple things that I'd like to get into the project with you. Does anybody want to ask Patrick any questions? I don't know if you're all on mute or not. I don't know if this was a good time to let Patrick speak up a little bit and then, you know, and then Patrick, you can enjoy your night or relax or whatever you want to do. I have a question. Sure. Patrick? Yes? Where did you get your rams of lift? Was it specific to an altitude that you were looking to achieve in uh, this particular experiment? or was there some other reason? Over to you. So for the uh, amount of lift that was calculated using the total weight of the uh, payload plus around eight grams. So if you imagine it was the transmitter device plus the, um, the solar panels plus any wiring plus the actual weight of the balloon itself, we wanted all of that plus around eight grams of lifts to make sure that it got up in the air. And because of the nature of the balloon where it kind of expands like a mylar balloon it gets really rigid once it gets up to a certain height uh it just stops going as high as any higher than that so because there we had that eight grams of free lift it expanded till it got to its maximum around forty thousand feet and then it just stood there okay so that's a given the eight grams yeah uh, they did come out of nowhere. That, that Tom, the, I'll, I'll chime in on that one because that was the um, first encounter we had with anybody who had these hot, what's called high pressure balloons. Some people call them Pico balloons, but these high pressure balloons that came right from the manufacturer. It said, if you want this balloon to go up quickly, use okay. this amount mm -hmm. of mass. If you want it to be, to be reliable, use between seven and eight grams of lift. So in that case, the guys just followed those those instructions okay. and then we decided to these guys decided to use high you know it was between hydrogen and helium helium obviously being more expensive which wasn't actually a concern um but safer um and then they wanted the 
5,000 feet of extra lift that hydrogen off. So, but we chose hydrogen because I knew I could trust these guys also. So they were like, let's do the hydrogen. Yeah. And this Thank is you. Charlie. I have a question for Patrick. Did you have to get any certifications or, or approvals to be able to get this balloon up in the air from any uh, authorities, FAA or whatever? Um, outside of the radio license, because the balloon is uh, small and it's going up beyond the range of any commercial airlines, but we did not need any uh, FAA certifications. Okay, fine. Right. I had a question, like, is this, uh, is this uh, a class of students, is uh, like the honors uh, oh, uh, class, or does it have like Beavis and Butthead in it, or, or <laughs> what level? Of... <laughs> well, theoretically, anyone could sign up for it, but it is a an extra class that we take, so Normally, we have seven classes in our schedule. This is considered an eighth class. So what happens is only the kids that really want to go into this eighth class do it. The, the variety, the, what, what Patrick probably can't speak of, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, is that the variety of students, you make a good point about there is a lack of Beavis and Butthead in the class. <laughs> uh, having said that, the level of talent in terms of STEM, whoa, is insanely disparate. Um, you have people like Patrick who are very tech savvy, and then you have other people who just like technology and they know nothing about it. So the level of talent in the class is wild. It's, it couldn't be more varied than it is. I see Steve has a hand up. Why are yeah, I? Hey, Dave, uh, I, I commend you on the, on the passion you, you expressed about teaching. It's, it's really inspirational. And, and, and Patrick is a good example, I think, of your uh, of that passion. The, the question, I know, Dave, you're recently licensed as a ham to enable this. And I'm wondering, you know, Patrick and, and all the students, has this led to a, an interest in ham radio or, or related technology? Uh, I know for me personally, I was pretty interested in, I actually kind of wanted my own license, especially the, the more I was getting into, into the more advanced one. Uh, I don't think I could I don't think currently I have the knowledge to like get into it, but I think looking forward, I probably would want to get a license just just to have it because it's look re looks really interesting. Patrick, don't don't sell yourself short. I think the youngest license holder of the most advanced uh, grade is or was at the time eight or nine years old. So you, <laughs> you you've got a couple of uh, you've got a good head start. So, yeah, Thank just you. maybe one one last question, uh, Patrick. Just really quickly, what was the worst moment in terms of being a project manager on this project? Definitely, great question. The day we launched, oh, it was kind of cloudy and oh, it was oh. a bit late. And uh, Mr. Snyder came out with a small mylar balloon, like a party balloon, and I was holding it. I was he he handed it off to me, and I hold, held it by the rope, and the balloon ripped out of my hand because of the wind. The, just, just a smile on my own. I was terrified because I knew that if that wind kept up, that our balloon would have just crashed. And not only that, but after we launched the balloon, it looked like it wasn't rising. And for a while, we didn't get any transmission. And I thought that it was over like a couple hours after it started. But look, look at how the, it all changed. It's amazing. You're right, Patrick. That was like, those were some very stressful. We, we should not have, we, you know, we probably could have reconsidered, but uh, because it's a school and because we have a very fixed schedule, we don't have the availability to postpone like NASA does very easily. These guys had scoped this day out for uh, probably at uh, least three weeks of what day to launch. And websites don't have good updated weather information until you get to like 16 days. And even the 16 day ones, they're really not that reliable. Well, <laughs> a week and a half before we these guys picked the day. And by the way, they picked the day and got approval for it from the school, which is, again, still awesome. They, um, It was supposed to be a calm day. <laughs> we get to our facility. The American flag is almost sideways. <laughs> you know, we probably, you know, should not have launched. But the reason we did is because this was actually phase one of a two-phase project. Because phase, uh, we were basically just simply the recording that maybe some of you have seen, um, 
and the, the clips that were on the news, we recorded that day as trial and error to then learn from this experience for us, not to teach anybody else yet. It was to learn because we were going to then two weeks later do the real launch. So the launch that maybe you've seen was not supposed to be the real launch. This was like, all right, let's learn from our mistakes and launch and let's see what happens, right? Doing everything as best we can. And then it turned out to be the launch. We're not, the only reason we're going to launch one more balloon is because one kid who was invaluable to the team had hockey practice and he couldn't make it. So we're going to launch one more, but only for his enrichment. All right. So anything else for Patrick? I don't suppose you're able to get the balloon and the transmitter and the cameras and all this thing uh, back after you launched it. I suppose it uh, probably crashed in the ocean or something. Well, that's yeah. uh, that's actually an amazing question because that's what where I'm going next with this is I'm going to talk about the evolution of this project um, and how it's evolved, not with these guys, but how it's evolved over the past five years. We used to launch, you know, the the big styrofoam box payloads, right? And, you know, they're very, you have to recover them. You, you know, you put your GoPro on them, your GPS device, et cetera. And you finally have this payload that's 1.2 kilograms, right? This thing is, it comes down with a parachute, right? Um, and you have to recover your payload in order to get all your information, like your video back and things like that. We were storing our weather data on board on the device. First of all, I wasn't licensed back five years ago. Anyhow, um, we put a little computer called the Raspberry Pi on there, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. So that evolved into this project where we said, you know what? We're not getting this one back, right? We're going to launch a balloon and we're going to take this 14 gram payload from Bill Brown down in Alabama. Brilliant device, brilliant device. And I want to update you on him as well. He's working on a, a whisper as well. We decided that we're not going for distance anymore. We've gone for vertical, excuse me. We've gone for vertical distance several times doing all sorts of different projects each year. And then this year we said, you know what? I'm, first of all, I'm sick and tired of fetching these things. I'm driving. We launch from Pennsylvania. I then have to drive to Connecticut and New York and all. One year I went into a community in the woods and almost got killed by a guy who thought I was, uh, you know, honest, I said, this is ridiculous. I'm a STEM teacher and I'm almost getting killed in the woods. So uh, anyhow, um, so I just wanted to give you a little, little bit of background. Now let's get to the project itself with a little bit of pictures and things. Patrick, you can hang, you do whatever you want. I just can't thank you enough for, you know, giving some of your time. Patrick's not getting any points or extra credit for this. Although Patrick doesn't need any extra credit points in my class anyhow. <laughs> thank so you, Patrick. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Have Thank a good you, night. Good job, Pat. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. All right. So let me go back to this really quickly. So I'm going to share a couple things with you. One is I, I don't want to show you this whole clip. This is us back from 2016. So what we did was we launched this very heavy payload. This one was an open frame payload. And so we did testing and our school didn't know that we launched that. Uh, we were testing the uh, descent of our parachute. But I don't want to show you this whole video. I just want to skip ahead and just show you the nature of what we did do. So I went to school at the University of Scranton. So you could see on this particular payload, we the guys, this particular project was probably just as much me as it was the students. And I'm not proud of that. Right. But as time went on, I decided to, you know, relinquish more and more control. In this case, uh, we decided to do an open frame and some batteries run out because this, this particular payload went 95,000 feet. And so right in the middle is an onboard flight computer. None of this is transmitting back to us except for the, um, the GPS device that you probably see the orange spot gen three right over here and then those don't work well beyond sixty thousand feet so there comes a period where when you launch this it goes dark and you don't know what is going on and you don't know if you're ever going to communicate with it again so this is a pretty massive payload and again we had to go get it all right so here's some pretty nice views wow 
and then it landed. <laughs> it went from the University of Scranton. This one didn't go far. This one went to Tenafly, New Jersey, and I hired a tree climber to get it out of this 120 foot high tree. We had an audio beacon on this, so it would chirp. Well, this particular year, that was a great decision because it landed in the woods, right? And there's no trails to finding things when they're in the middle of the woods. So this thing was chirping and I can't hear as well as I used to. And it's a pretty high pitch. My students heard it. We tracked it down and we were dead in the woods. You know, we couldn't find it any longer. And there it was. So I hired a tree climber to come get it back and get it down for us. And man, when we took that device, and we took that home and there's my feet when that thing got it from the, from the trees. When we got this home and we opened up the flight computer and we started seeing how high this wound up going, that it went 95,000 feet, that it got to, I don't know how you're familiar you are with atmospheric pressure, but our atmospheric pressure today on a day like today is about 1,013. This atmospheric pressure got down to seven millibars of atmospheric pressure. At that, you saw the size of the balloon, right? It, the, you saw the size of the balloon right there, right? This balloon is latex, so obviously the higher it goes, the bigger it gets. The bigger it gets, the higher it goes, right? And it just keeps going vertically until this balloon explodes, and then it falls down on a parachute that just deploys on its own, um, just from the atmosphere. This balloon, would have been the size of a one car garage when it finally exploded, all right? But this project was fascinating. Up until this point in my career, this was the coolest thing that I had ever seen students do. And it blew all of our minds. Uh, and this project made it on News 12, which was, that was pretty cool for the students. Um, and that was a lot of fun. But then again, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I can't keep fetching things from random locations, you know, driving two to three hours. And to be honest with you, you don't even know if you're getting this stuff back. You don't know if you're going to get jumped in the woods, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so we decided, these, they did, that once we found these high pressure balloons, and again, if any of you are unfamiliar with this, these, pre these balloons basically inflate almost like the Michelin man, right? They get to a maximum volume and then they don't get any bigger. So if they don't get any bigger, they can't go any higher. And the only thing that's gonna crash that balloon is day and night, a little bit of thermal expansion and contraction. It's gonna beat the balloon up over time. It's not, they're not built to last forever, which leads to the only negative of this project. And I, it really probably is the only negative. And that is that I feel horrible that when it's done, I have these two permanent, they're not biodegradable, um, these two bags that are, if they landed in a tree, to be honest with you, I don't think I'd feel as guilty, but landing in the ocean, that still kind of bothers me. So this is not going to be a project that I'm going to be cranking out constantly. I might do maybe one balloon a year with students. Um, a lot of people are doing it, but I just think that, you know, that this balloon, you know, in the ocean and it's a big object and it's really, it's not going to biodegrade. And so you don't get this back. You don't know where it's going to land and, you know, and you don't get this payload back. So the, then where we, we've done this now, this particular type of launch, the students each year had to decide how to make the project different than the year before right? They had to improve it somehow, or they had to test for something, to test for something different, different types of batteries or using it, many their own flight computer, things like that. And then this year I said, fellas, if you want to do this type of launch, we're going to wind up doing something different. And, but it's going to be something where I'm not going to go get it anymore. This class has not these particular guys, but we've done things where we've put GPS trackers in the ocean. A student was very concerned about Sandy Hook beaches getting closed. So he had the idea to track water at, as it drained from the Passaic River into the Raritan Bay, which leads to the Sandy Hook Bay. And we've put GPS trackers in the water as well. And I said, fellas, this is the kind of project that we're going to do, something where I don't, I don't have to go get it any longer. So if you don't mind, uh, what I'd like to do is not necessarily show you this video because you could look at this video on your own time, um, but just go through 
a couple of the things about the, not the logistics of the project, but a little bit of the nuts and bolts of it so that maybe somebody else could be inspired to do a, a similar type of project. So let me skip right to this slide. And you'll see in a little bit, here is the, the balloon. It's about eight feet tall. You do need to do this as the video states. We bought this balloon from a guy out in California who I thought the world record for laps around the world was six. As it turns out, for college students, the record is six. This guy apparently, I think, had something like 70 laps around the earth, right? And all we were trying to do, this first launch, all we wanted to do was get our device to transmit once it went above 2,000 meters, which remind me, I will come back to 2,000 meters in a second. But that's what we wanted for this first one. And then the second run, we're like, for the second phase, we wanted to see if we could make it to Europe. And that was going to be everything for us. If we could make it to Europe, this is going to be everything. And little did we know, we're now on, uh, as of two days ago, one balloon we haven't heard from, and one balloon crossed over Florida and transmitted to Florida, and it's on its fifth lap right now. So uh, the guys are still still tracking it. So here's the device, all right? 14 grams, absolutely amazing device. If you went to a, like a, there's a chat, Pico Balloon, one word. Um, there's a chat room, you can just search for Pico Balloon and message board or discussion group. And one of the main guys in there is this guy, Bill Brown from down in Alabama. And, uh, I put his email in here for you. And this device right over here, uh, I think he, for schools, he sells it for like 150 bucks. Oh my God. The, like the best 150 bucks I ever spent in my life. Really amazing, amazing product. And if it can get my students kind of jazzed up about radio and ham radio, or APRS, hey, great great money well spent. And then just to skip along, you need this heat sealer. And by the way, if any of you were going to do this and there's equipment that you wanted to maybe not buy, but maybe borrow from me, just meet me in West Orange and I'd be happy to share any of the stuff that I have. And then some other things about like the scale that you'll see here, you know, you take a known mass, preferably about a hundred grams, you put it on the scale, and then you just measure the lift and the, this process we knew we needed to make a video for the process because it is so wildly different than inflating a latex balloon, right? The crazy thing about this inflation process, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is that it's not an airtight, teal, airtight seal at the bottom. The hydrogen is just going into the balloon and filling the balloon and it could easily come out, but there's not a lot of pressure pushing that gas out. All right, so you need hydrogen. And then one of the things that I need to mention in the video is that the hydrogen tank that we rented, the hydrogen was not expensive at all. The tank is, I think we got this giant tank rental for uh, 180 bucks, something like that, compared to helium, which is now going for about 400 bucks. And so a lot less expensive, but to fit on my pressurized hose, you have to make sure that by when you leave the facility that you rent this from, that you have the right hydrogen gas adapter to go on your pressurized fitting. And skip along, uh, my student made this video. I didn't make this video at all. And it wasn't Patrick who made it, it was another student. So he put, you know, the different things that you could use for the particular launch. Really, to be honest with you, you actually don't need the radio for the launch itself. We wanted to because we were stressed out. We were stressed that this device from Bill Brown wasn't going to communicate with us properly and we were really nervous about it so we want that's why we brought or i brought my handheld radio with me uh hot spot you don't need a hot spot this is just if you have no wi-fi you'll need a hot spot because you're going to be obsessed with going on aprs.fi to see how quickly you can how quickly this balloon will get beyond 2,000 meters where it's then going to start communicating okay so let me skip ahead there's the balloon itself. And I don't think I want to, you know, go through the, the whole video right now, but there's the balloon and it's a tough material. Apparently is kind of humorous. It's what they use to cover sushi with at a restaurant so that, you know, organisms don't attack it and gases don't rise up from the sushi. Um, but that's what this material is. And it was developed out in California. The guys, uh, father and son team teamed up to make this. They put 
hundreds of thousands of dollars into the device to make this. And they're not doing it for profit. They're just doing it to sell. You know, each each balloon, I think, was about maybe 150, 180 bucks. Um, but they're they're losing money like crazy. They're in, they're into it for the spirit of it. That's us weighing our you know payload with anything that we think we're going to put on that, like the fishing line. And, uh, again, this goes step by step. Here is obviously our hydrogen tank. But once you open that, if you've ever worked with gases before, once you open up this valve, no matter how low, no matter how little you open that up, that pressure is going to fill up that gas line. So that when you do squeeze this, it's going to put a shot of hydrogen somewhere. So you just, we have the guys put a little shot into the atmosphere and then back into the balloon. And they, these guys were really patient that, and that's them filling the process up. And if you're interested, obviously you can go back and watch the video, but I just want to skip to some of the really important details of this. So now, if you'll notice this is now, you'll notice that this balloon really doesn't have that much hydrogen in it. It's not a rigid balloon at all. It's barely even buoyant. It's barely even buoyant. Completely different than our previous launches. In our previous launches of latex balloons, we would have a 1200 gram payload in comparison to 20 grams, right? A 1200 gram payload, and we would have 1800 grams of buoyancy on that. This had a difference, right? A difference of eight grams of buoyancy, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the stress level that we had. We did not think that this balloon was going to go up. We knew it was going to go horizontal and we had a tree line to beat, right? So it was pretty stressful, but you could see how, you know, this balloon is very loose, not filled with a lot of hydrogen. And they just keep, it's, you have to be very patient with this. The manufacturer of the balloon almost discouraged us from doing this project. He's like, if you don't have the perfect conditions in a room to do this, it's going to be an epic failure. I'm like, great. <laughs> so, so, so why bother even? Do, but he really was almost like discouraging. So we had to shut the HVAC off. The school was really cooperative. We could not launch this on a day that was 20 degrees because I had to ask the school to shut this garage's HVAC system off and we didn't want to burst any pipe. That was, by the way, out of everything that we did, that was a little bit obsessive on our part. We had to shut the HVAC off because we could not have the air swirling around, but we did not need to make the temperature of the room the same as the temperature outside. But I'm also a chemistry teacher. And from the gas laws, Charles' law, Boyle's law, ideal gas law, I wanted this balloon to mimic the outside air. And once I taught the students about the gas laws, they're like, that's it. Boom. I don't care how cold it is. Felt, they were all like, fellas, you can all bundle up. We're having this room mimic the outside air. So to move along a little bit, this heat sealer, I don't remember how much this was. This heat sealer was the one that was recommended from Scientific Balloon, the Scientific Balloon Company. That's the name of the Scientific Balloon. Um, recommended from them. We heat sealed the, the bottom of the balloon. I think we heat sealed it like four times. Obviously not in the same area because if we did that in the same area, now we're going to ruin the integrity of the seal, right? But we, we sealed it. We had enough room to seal this across four different times. That was their decision, not mine. The student actually, again, as these all, then that little piece of cap down tape right down at the bottom because it's really strong because you need the, the fishing line to run through the tape and through the balloon so it wouldn't just fall right through the balloon. Oh, <laughs> this was a great, op I was a Boy Scout. Now, I wasn't a good one, um, but I did learn a bowline knot. I, it was an opportunity to teach them this knot because we said this thing, we cannot have this payload fall off this balloon. This wasn't necessary. We used a piece of, um, we used a big piece of painters, a thin, very thin painter's tarp because one student, and I, I didn't want to step on their idea. So it was one of the students' ideas to take this big piece of tarp and cover the balloon with it to bring it outdoors, to have one guy on each corner, to have one guy on each corner to bring the balloon outdoors so that it wouldn't get caught on the garage door or anything like that. And you know what? To be honest with you, I thought it 
it was a good idea. I wasn't so sure if it was necessary, but it was a student idea and I had to go with it. And then, so that here we are, we're about to bring it outdoors. Obviously this is the balloon right over here. Anybody who touched the balloon had to wear gloves and uh, they're walking all the way over to the bleachers. They launched, the students wanted to launch a pilot balloon as Patrick described. That was such a smart move on their part. Uh, that's not on the video, but they launched a pilot balloon to see really how the winds were blowing. Really sort of like, you know, ground truth. Instead of just looking at the American flag to really see what a balloon would do in this environment. So we launched a Mylar balloon and we launched one from a baseball field. And we launched then this, this guy right over here, um, the last guy holding the balloon, had the idea to launch it from the bleachers to get a little bit of, and I'm like, again, I'm like, you know what? It's your idea. It's a student project. I got to do it, right? And so then... And with the final countdown, it was gone. All right, three, two, wait for it to go. All right, you might have heard, I don't know if the audio is coming through to you guys or not, but you might have heard this one student, Jordan Keyless. By the way, the student right here is uh, probably, if he gets in, he's looking to go to the Naval Academy. But he just said, wait till we let it go. What he was referring to was instead of letting the device which is close to their feet, smack the ground and hit the ground. He wanted this guy, he's, he was just reminding him, look, don't let it go, because it's gonna get beat to heck on the bleachers. Let it go once the balloon is up in the air. And then- One, go. Now we're doing so much better. Okay. It looks like a jellyfish, right? So I'm at getting to the point where I'm going to take some questions from you in a moment, but not that one, not that one. If you go to shp.org forward slash balloon, what you'll get there is you'll get a whole bunch of professional uh, photographs, but then this right over here is the News 12. The News 12 broadcast has a video from a drone and that view is pretty awesome. This describes the project. And then at the bottom, I wanted our community to know about how to go to APR, how to track this thing, right? Because that's like the excitement of it is that, yeah, these students were psyched about it, but I made, a, um, I made an instructional video that shows people how to go to APRS.FI and try to track this balloon. All right, so I'll take questions in a moment, but there are a couple more things that I wanted to do. As of two days ago, so at APRS.FI, you type in the call sign of this particular balloon, and then what happens when you buy the when you buy the payload from Bill Brown, he asks you for your call sign, and then he just puts a dash one, depending on how many you bought, right? Dash one, dash two, dash three, dash four. We've purchased four so far. We've launched two, and we have uh, we have two more. So. The nice thing about this is this one shows you, here's the information that you would probably really want. So if you go to APRS.FI and search my, the call sign KD2VGT-2, then you guys could see the telemetry from this. And what this APRS website does is I can click on this and I can get all the nitty gritty detail that, details that you guys would really be interested in. Um, for one, you basically see the details on this screen, but I'll show you something in a moment. Um, you, solar, 4.242 volts, that's amazing sunlight, all right? Once you start, you're not going to get, you're not going to get any good quality communication with these solar panels until the sun is about 15 degrees above the horizon right? So you're like, oh, it's sunrise. It's sunrise, everybody. Let's see, you know, it's sunrise in China right now. Let's see if it's in China. No, you have to wait usually till about 9, 9.30 in the morning is when we got the most reliable communication. And it's going to, it's going to stop communicating well before sunset. But it gives you the voltage. So once you start getting down to voltages that are in like the mid threes, 3.6, etc., then you know that it's about to go to sleep for the night. Temperature, I mean, temperature minus 11 degrees Celsius. Um, and then when I click show telemetry on this particular site, and I'm not going to show you all the details here, but when you click and you can get much deeper, you can get, again, solar, temperature, 
the obviously the location in terms of latitude longitude but so this might obviously look very boring on the screen but this basically gives you all the information about the station that it communicated with all right um, you could click on that particular station and find out where it is and this has some of that telemetry you can also visit a site called hab hub high altitude ballooning hub Org. My students and I, we liked APRS.FI much better than HabHub because HabHub treats your balloon like it's a latex balloon. So when it loses communication with your balloon, it then extrapolates your balloon's path and it goes up in the atmosphere. It thinks that it explodes and then it tells you where it landed. And none of that is true. We followed HabHub for the first couple days. And we're like, oh, fellas, the balloon exploded. Ha look at HabHub. But again, just to reiterate what I just said in case I wasn't clear, it, HabHub takes all the information that's known. And then when it doesn't get any information, it extrapolates the rest if it were a latex balloon. And that's information that we had no desire. So we stuck with this APRS.FI. And, uh, and that worked really well for us. And the very last thing that I'll say uh, is about the, uh, uh, let me zoom out a little bit. This right over here was the start of the fifth lap around the earth. One of the things that's fascinating for you who have better licenses than I do, Bill Brown also has a whisper payload and this is the extent of my radio knowledge, is that he's using much larger uh, wavelengths that can communicate in some areas across the ocean. So we would have been able to, if I had a higher license, that would have been the way to go because I would have had much better telemetry, not at nighttime, of course, right? But I would have had much better telemetry over, for example, Mexico. I would have had much better telemetry over Africa. Better when you go, when these balloons go over Africa and then the Middle East, you're not going to hear from that thing for days. And then if it goes over China at nighttime, forget it. You have a half a lap around the earth that you never even heard of because of the limitations of the technician's license. But with the whisper, now you're getting, you know, much greater odds of communication over vast territories that don't have typical um, ability to communicate. And then I can't answer any questions about that. <laughs> That's it. But what Bill's working on is I reached out to him and said, look, I understand that I can use the 10 meter with my license any chance, you know, that you could rig up one of these, because it's way beyond my uh, ability, uh, talent level, you know, and he's like, you know what, Dave, I think I'm going to. So for people like me, right, with their technician class license, he's working on, he's already launched one, and it, he said it didn't go that well. He already launched uh, one that was Whisper 10 meter, so I could use it with my technician class license. And, you know, find out where this device is but for people like you who probably have a you know most of you I'm sure have a license better than the technicians class and if you don't then you could work with someone who does then my god I mean to do this kind of project with whisper would be mind-blowing you know to find out you know that you how you can track this thing during the day virtually virtually anywhere you know, that would be, that would be an incredible project. So in summer, quick summary, it was supposed to be a two phase project, two balloons on one launch day as the experimental process to live and learn um, and really have these guys experience this project hands-on and then have them go back and figure out what they wanted to improve upon. And that's why we recorded this day. We didn't record this session for it to be on the news. <laughs> we recorded this for our own learning experience for phase two. 
and phase two hasn't happened because phase one went as well as it did. But man, as a teacher, you know, to have, when that one student, Patrick, sent me a text message that said it made it to France when all we cared about was that yeah. we actually got communication above 2,000 meters, you know, it was absolutely mind-blowing. Our school was, er like, erupting. It was, it was pretty, pretty awesome. And these guys were just proud of themselves. They'll probably remember more from that experience than, they, than the same students who I teach in chemistry. They're not going to remember, uh, you know, Boyle's Law in 20 years from now. But these guys in this class, they'll probably remember this kind of experience. So great project that they owned big time. So I can't answer any radio questions, <laughs> but, um, but I can probably answer anything else if you even have anything else. <laughs>